Hello and welcome to another Dev Diary for Crusader Kings 3. And just as before, first off we're going to just go back to the previous Dev Diary and have a look at the old uh, dev messages. Uh, there's only one to add on to this and it's actually quite an interesting one as well. To add a few things on to the barony discussion, which is people don't like that baronies aren't able to go into other people's countries. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that and as I said in the previous video, I'm kind of happy about that because it was really annoying. Uh, there wasn't very many benefits. Yes, it might be historically accurate, which I guess is a benefit, but it was just pure annoyance and I wasn't a fan. So, um, yeah, the discussion is basically we don't like it that baronies can't go to other countries. We like the historical accuracy, blah, blah, blah. Right, so the baronies discussion. As stated already, baronies will always be considered to be part of a country. However, we do have a concept of leasing baronies to other rulers such as holy orders. This effectively gives them control of the holding along with the income it generates without it leaving your realm. Go into further details in the future. And yeah, I think this is a pretty good compromise because yeah, leasing things to, to holy orders, like holy orders owning land inside someone else's country makes total sense. I like it. I'm totally happy with it not being, you know, uh, King of France has inherited a barony in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. I, I hated that, and I'm glad to see it gone. And I know people are going to disagree with that with me, but... Eh, I, nah, I, I don't care. I like it. Anyway, uh, that's, that's basically everything there, so uh, let's get on to the actual dev diary. So, this one is going to be on war, which is, in my opinion, probably the most important part of any grand strategy game. If you don't get war right, your game's probably not very good. So, first off, let's have a look at the screenshot we got here, which is quite interesting. We can see we've got four different types of siege engine. Uh, we've got a mangonel, a, a bigger mangonel, a trebuchet, which can launch a 60 kilogram rock over 300 meters don't you know and then i want to say it, it's a battering ram but at the same time it looks a bit like a cannon so i i don't know i mean later on in the timeline for crusader kings cannons absolutely were a thing um so it could very well be that um but at the same time it looks like it's being rocked back and forth on a on those strings but yeah it's it's all it's definitely a cannon though um big bertha it's, it's pretty big and huge and stuff and i also really like the unit model for the uh for the little castle there it's very nice anyway let's get on to the dev diary greetings war what is it good for uh absolutely nothing apart from making a good grand strategy game you may ask a whole lot i'd say you can use it to press that juicy claim you've been holding on to for a while or perhaps you'd rather use it uh, to put the unbelievers to the sword. Whichever strikes your fancy, the topic of the day is war, and more specifically, how we go about waging war. I aim to give you an overview of how wars will be fought. I will not go into details about CVs or anything like that at this time. Bear in mind that this game is very much in development, and everything talked about here is subject to change. The, the usual disclaimers. Let's start by looking at what an army is made up of. Just like in CK2, the bulk of your armies consist of levies. Levies in CK3 are made up of their own unit type, simply called levy. These are essentially conscripted peasants forced to do your bidding and are not very impressive on their own. In great numbers, however, they are efficient meat shields meant to complement the troops of your armies that have a higher impact, men at arms. So, yeah, levies are, I mean, it's no longer like light infantry, it's just... You know, you're peasants, basically. That's, I like it. So we've got, uh, seeing the total amount of soldiers, you can see heavy infantry, archers, and heavy cavalry. That would be your levies. Eight knights as well. I'd love to, I hope that's going to be important here. And then just a ton of levies as well. Men-at-arms are the equivalent to retinues of CK2. They are trained troops that come in several different unit types, which excel in their given role. There are basic variations available for everyone to recruit, such as light cavalry and heavy infantry, but the really interesting ones are usually unique to certain cultures or specific regions of the map. They'll all have their own stats and uses. Speaking of stats, there are four different values present on men-at-arms regiments that you need to keep track of. So I got damage. The amount of damage a single soldier of this type is able to inflict on the opponent. 
toughness, how much damage it can take, pursuit, in the aftermath of battle, pursuit increases the amount of damage you can inflict upon a routing enemy, and screen, the opposite of pursuit, screen allows you to protect feeling, uh, fleeing soldiers from being killed. A very different, I think, uh, way of doing it to CK2, I like it. So we've got pikemen, uh, so pikemen counters light and heavy cavalry. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, it's good in woods and it looks like mountains. Not sure pikes were really that good in mountains. Like, the whole reason Macedon fell in, you know, against Rome is because they used pikemen in mountains and their formation got all fucked up and the Romans just basically murdered them because of that. Uh, but hey ho. Long pikes allow these regiments to form walls of spikes that can stop a cavalry charge dead. Personally, I, I think it would probably stop an infantry charge dead as well. Um, I don't know if being on foot allows you to be, you know, more suicidal against a, a wall of pikes, uh, I guess. Anyway, not all men at arms are equal. You'll have access to a few immediately from the start and unlock access to additional regiment types as you progress throughout the game. Some will be similar to each other, but may be tailored towards certain terrain type. Others may just be a straight upgrade, but will in those cases be much more expensive than their weaker counterpart. Men at Arms allow you to customize your army for any given situation. If you know where or who you will fight, certain Men at Arms will be far superior. Is there a lot of hilly terrain in your region? Then archers are the way to go. Are you facing a lot of cavalry? Bring pikemen. A smaller army will stand a much higher chance of winning if you bring a Man at Arms type that counters those of the enemy. While a regiment is countered, its efficiency in battle will drop by, with its damage output significantly reduced. If the countered regiment is greatly outnumbered by the countering type, efficiency will reduce even further. There's a limit to how much mana arms damage can be reduced, though, as to not make your expensive troops completely useless. Next, we have a special type of man at arms siege weapons. Medieval warfare was all about sieges. Castles and sieges are very iconic for the time frame, so we felt it was necessary to have that properly represented. You'll start off with access to a rather weak catapult, but it will still allow you to besiege holdings faster than without one. Later on, you'll unlock improved siege weapons such as trebuchets that are able to speed up sieges significantly. So, yeah, catapult, mangonel, trebuchet, cannon. It's definitely a cannon. Uh, you can only own a certain number of mana arms regiments at any given time, so choose carefully which troops you decide to recruit. Levies and mana arms are not the only soldiers available to you. As a ruler, you have a number of knights at your disposal. These are the vassals and courtiers of the realm with high prowess, which is equivalent to combat rating in CK2, and represents how good a character is at fighting and is used when they participate in battles. You can only, only have a few dedicated knights, but there are various ways to increase the number of knights as well as their effectiveness. So we've got Duke Dido of Lausitz. He's a spy master and vassal. You can force allow and forbid him to, I guess, be a commander. Force him to be a commander, allow him or forbid him. Yeah, makes sense. And he's got a, I guess this is the prowess symbol of 15. And a plus five something. Don't know. Finally, we have the commander. An army can only have a single commander who uses his martial skill to improve the troops under his command. There are plenty of different commander traits available, uh, which either have a direct effect on battles, such as terrain bonuses, or give the commander bonuses outside of battles. One such example is the ability to have supply last longer. More on this below. So you can see the different um, commanders that you have. Uh, you, the Count Richard, etc, etc. Uh, this guy's a knight. Uh, there's another knight. Oh, actually, this is interesting. There is your knight and then just a knight. Or maybe he is your knight as well. It's just saying, not saying it because he's your marshal knight. Yeah, 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 no, that makes sense. Okay. And then we've got Holy Warrior, which adds Faith Hostility Advantage plus 10. Makes sense. With armies out of the way, let's have a look at battles. At the very start of any battle, a combat width is decided how many troops are able to fight each other at the same time. The width is set to the relative size of the defender, depending on the terrain type you're fighting in, being larger in flat and open terrain, and smaller in rough terrain and mountains. I would generally advise against attacking larger enemies in plains, for example. Relative size of the defender. Uh, okay. Uh, the single most important part of the battle is advantage, which is essentially a modifier that increases the damage of all troops on either side. When a battle starts, all sources of advantage is taken into consideration. It can come from traits, terrain, building, etc., but most importantly, the martial skill of your commander. 
All these are added together for both sides of the battle. The difference is then added as the advantage bonus for the side with a higher advantage. Example, your army has a total advantage of 40 and attacks an enemy army that has a lousy total of 10. This means you'll have an advantage bonus of 30 during the battle, which then translates into a rather significant damage bonus for your troops. It's definitely... It feels like a different way of doing things, but at the same time, it's... I guess the effects are kind of just like, you know, your fire and shock pips. It's just a modifier to a roll. Maybe? I don't know, actually. That's not really... It, it is different. It's definitely different, but... We'll have to wait and see what the effects of it is, I guess. And I guess that would be what this is. Plus five advantage, perhaps? Makes, makes a bit of sense. Yeah, I like it. Um, in addition to... Star yeah, in addition to the starting advantage, each commander also makes a roll every few days in an attempt to increase their advantage or even it out. This tug of war can be further expanded by various modifiers and traits. For example, the trait Cautious Leader will decrease your potential max roll, but also increase your lowest possible roll, trading in a higher potential for a higher advantage. These exist to make even battles a tad bit unpredictable, but will rarely be the deciding factor. I actually really like that. That's, that's a very interesting way of doing it uh, yeah i'm i'm in favor of that i'm trying to imagine what that would be like if it was added to eu4 for example having you know m modifying dice rolls rather than you know just adding pips to it is a much more interesting system i think i like it okay Soldiers on the combat line damage the enemy every tick. When a soldier dies, he will be considered either to be a casualty or to be routed. Casualties, you guessed it, are considered dead and will have to be replenished over time. Routed soldiers, on the other hand, are troops that are injured or fled the battle and are added back to the army once the battle is resolved. Battles are resolved once either side runs out of fighting troops. I love this. This is awesome. One of the big problems I've had with EU4 and uh, CK2... And, and Imperator to an extent as well, is that not all of the battles, like, if you have 20,000 casualties, they're not all dead. And a lot of them are just people who ran away, but they're still in the army. And that doesn't really come across in EU4 until, you know, the morale runs out and everyone runs away. This, I really like. This is really, really good, I think. So, it sort of reminds me a little bit about uh, the Imperator naval combat, because ships can run away and not be sunk, or they could be captured and not sunk, and, you know, not every loss on your side is a sinking. Um, so that, you know, I like it. That's, that's really, really good. It should allow for much more realistic death counts in battles, where, yes... You might absolutely smash the enemy, but the casualties might not be that high. Um, it should allow for, say, if your army has a much higher morale, perhaps, then you could have evenly sized armies and you win the battle, but losses on both sides aren't that high. I really, really like this. This is a very interesting system. Once the battle is won, it enters the aftermath phase, which lasts for a few days. This is when the victor has the opportunity to chase down and kill any survivors, uh, the routed troops. As mentioned earlier, this is the time for a certain amount of arms to shine. With a high pursuit, you can kill a larger amount of the enemy to really capitalize on your victory. Alternatively, you can have a high amount of screen to make losing battles less penalizing. Keep in mind that battles will grant you a fairly limited amount of war score, which brings us to sieges. Alright, so two things to really talk about here. Um, if the amount of pursuit you have is high enough it kind of kills everything that i was excited for in this paragraph um i guess you you might want to have a lot of pursuit sorry uh, a lot of um screen to make that a bit less so and i'd also like to see maybe if a battle is incredibly punishing or maybe you've marched for a long way before getting to the battle um without any kind of pauses you might not want to pursue because your troops need to replenish. So maybe it could be something that you could say, you know, if we win this battle, I would rather not pursue it. Instead, I'd get 
more of my casualties will turn into you know routed units or you know the 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 injured guys will be better off i guess because yeah that armies didn't always pursue beaten foes there was plenty of times in history where your army was just too tired so the enemy when they retreated retreated and got away hmm all right and also the second part uh Battles will grant you a fairly limited amount of war score. This is very different to CK2, where battles could be a significant amount of war score, like up to dozens of war score for one battle if it was big enough. So is that a little bit worrying? Perhaps. Um, I quite liked having lots of war score for battles. It made battles a bit more important, which I think they kind of should be. Um, we'll, we'll have to see how exactly they implement it, whether it is ridiculously limited where you get very little war score for a battle like the E4 or um, Imperator, or whether it is, you know, just a midway in between. Um, it is a little bit worrying though, let's be fair. Uh, besieging and occupying enemy holdings is the main way of gaining war score. Oh, sigh. And winning wars. As mentioned in last week's map dev diary, baronies are their own provinces. You will not have to siege all of them in order to occupy a full country or seize your war goal. Only fortified holdings have to be besieged. Castles and county capitals are all fortified by default, with how difficult it is to besiege these holdings decided by their fort level. Fort levels can be increased by certain buildings and modifiers. That seems fairly normal. Um, I wonder if there is a bonus to sieging the unfortified holdings like you know money and and captives and that kind of thing would be you know the norm i guess um and how long will it take to siege it just, is it a month thing just like one month tick and boom sieged maybe each fort level increases the amount of siege progress you will need to get before it is occupied you gain a base amount of siege progress every, every tick which can be increased further by heavily outnumbering the garrison or having siege weapons this constant progress won't change over the course of a siege. It allows you to know what the maximum duration of the siege will be, and you can take that into account as you plan your next move. That seems fairly similar to the way CK2 works. Sieges also have what we call siege events, which occur with a fixed interval, and you can make the siege progress faster by giving you a one-time siege progress bonus or increase your base siege progress. Um, also fairly similar to what we have in CK2 now. Siege weapons are acquired to get the Breached Walls event, which will in turn allow you to directly assault the holding. Oh, that is uh, very interesting. That means you can't assault the holding until you have a breach. I'm not okay with that, actually. I'm really not, because things like siege towers and ladders exist. Uh, if they add those as, you know, siege... Uh, uh, siege siege weapons uh then maybe that can if you have that then you can assault um obviously it'd be costly but those things existed and were used frequently so i i don't think that that should be really the case uh, this is a risky mover since it will cost you troops at the benefit of vastly increasing your daily siege progress okay it's, it's, mm, mm, yeah, not not too fond of that part. Being attacked while besieging a holding will make you the attacker of the battle, something we've seen before, making you lose out on any usual defender bonuses you would get from the terrain. Sieges are therefore slightly riskier, and assaulting the holding to gain control of it before the enemy attacks might be well worth the cost. A few final words on moving armies around. As I mentioned briefly in last week's Dev Diary thread, Major Rivers has been designated fords for crossing. You can no longer cross them freely, as in CK2, and will often have to move your army to find a good place to cross. Beware though, crossing a Major River will make you lose advantage should you engage an enemy in battle on the other side, making river crossings for perfect places to catch your opponent. Along with the increased amount of impassable terrain, there are plenty of bottlenecks that you can use to your advantage, pun intended. Okay. Um... I wonder, I wonder if, I mean, it says nothing here about, you know, zone of control, which is not a thing in CK2. 
but it wouldn't you can't really have a bottleneck if there is no zone of control you just walk past it hmm <laughs> that's I really want them to answer that question have you ever been annoyed by walking into a province for just a short while in CK2 only to go above the supply limit and lose a bunch of troops Fear not, armies now carry an amount of supply with them. Supply is drained whenever armies are in baronies with a lower supply limit than their size. You can therefore safely march through a few baronies with low supply limit without troops dying. If your army runs out of supply, however, it will start to take attrition and lose troops over time. Supply is increased as long as you are below the supply limit in territory you control. Beware though, your army might not take attrition on low supply, but it will suffer an advantage penalty in battles. I like it. That is good. That is very, very nice. Um, a, a basic supply system would make every game better. So, yeah, totally on board. Um, being low on supply affecting your advantage penalty? I mean, that that's okay too. I like it. Fair enough. Chasing armies deep into enemy land is certainly not recommended. Marching into a county controlled by the enemy that doesn't border anything you control and is not on the coast will make your army take a single and quite significant attrition hit. If you have a huge amount of troops to spare, though, then perhaps you don't need to worry about it. Um, hmm. That part I'm less okay with. Just immediately giving you an attrition hit. I mean, personally, I think it should it should still use the supply system. If you this this reads to me like if you move two counties into an enemy's territory, even if you have a full amount of supply you're just gonna take attrition immediately um i don't like that <laughs> i don't like that kind of at all really i think maybe instead of that you should take supply hit when you are in enemy territory that you don't control if you are sieging take a supply you know start using your supply instead of even if it is above the supply limit start taking supply um, but this, this is not, not what I like. I really don't like that. If you have a huge amount of troops to spare, though, maybe you don't need to worry about it. If you have a huge amount of troops, you're going to take a huge amount of attrition. Because attrition is percentage-based. The more troops you have, the more troops you lose. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of this part at all. Not, not at all. I hope that gets changed. Um, phew, that turned out to be a bit lengthier than expected. I hope you've gotten a fairly good, although slightly summarised picture of what to expect when waging war in CK3. Okay, well... My, my thoughts and feelings and opinions and all that, um, most of it, I quite like. Most of it, I really do like. The, the changes to the way advantage is, I like that quite a lot. Um, I would like to see you know, siege towers and siege ladders added to this roster of siege weapons. Um, the ability to assault only after you've made a breach is not so good. Um, and this huge attrition hit, as soon as you go too deep into enemy territory, regardless of the amount of supply you have, I'm really not a fan of. Um, the, the casualty system, quite like. Uh, the aftermath phase, a little bit iffy on. Uh, but I'm interested in knowing what you guys think. So please do leave me your comments in the comment section below. Um, do you agree with me on the points that I've raised here? Um, do, you, do you think I'm right? Or do you think it's not a problem? Or do you like it? I don't know. So let me know in the comment section below. And if you want to keep up to date with all CK3 news and updates, then... Uh, subscribe and because i'm going to keep doing these because they seem to be quite popular um and i enjoy doing them as well so thank you all very much for watching and i will see you in the next one Bye bye